Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Top Style Show. We're so excited and honored to have Colin Rose with us. He's the CEO and uh, the founder of Objective Reality Inc. He's uh, doing everything from VR game development to the VR arcade games to franchising to all kinds of businesses. He's an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. He owned uh, so many different businesses. We want to learn so much about him. But uh, at the same time, he is a veteran. And so it, it's just crazy. I don't want to bore you with that. Colin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, the, uh, I, I, want to, I, want to get to, I want to get to the objective reality first. So tell us a yeah. little bit about objective reality. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, so Objective Reality Games started as a VR arcade concept back in 2019. Um, first in the state of Ohio. Um, and matter of fact, the first company worldwide to market themselves as a VR escape room company. We've had some publicity for that. Um, but at the time, again, it, it was just a proof of concept. Nobody knew if this business model would work. Uh, there were a few in Europe that were doing pretty well, but none really in the United States. Um, so we reached out to Ubisoft and they were in the beginning phases of launching these VR escape room concepts that they created, looking for a partner to, to facilitate that here in the U S and we jumped on it. Uh, my wife and I took out a small business loan and, uh, and just, you know, built this business here in our hometown of Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, and, you know, not really knowing if it would, if it would pick up or not, but, uh, to our surprise, it, it's been uh, an overwhelming success, uh, you know, the VR arcade. But um, one thing that, that kind of threw a monkey wrench in the plan was we opened in October of 2019. And then obviously 2020 came um, yeah. very shortly after that. So, um, you know, being that we were such a new business, we didn't qualify for a lot of those COVID relief funds and different things that were going out, yeah. Um, yeah. which really put us in a tough position because we put our mortgage up, you know, for the loan and put us into a lot of really uncomfortable, you know, situations. But um, so we had to pivot and we had to think about how are we going to turn this business into something that people can do from home? Uh, because obviously they're not, they're not coming out to our storefront yeah. during this time. Um, so sat down, did a bunch of research, found that there was a technology, a streaming technology that was in early adoption that allowed users to connect virtually to a PC with their MetaQuest 2 headset at home and stream PC VR. Um, now, it had only primarily been done from a user who had a PC at their home to, you know, over their Wi-Fi connection, connecting to their MetaQuest headset, and it works, you know, it works for that. So that was what it was de designed to do. Uh, we reached out to the company that made this software and said, hey, do you mind if we package this and try to use it commercially here in and around our storefront to allow users to connect to our in-store servers and play from home? And they said, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that kind of started the streaming service uh, that, wow. that we've morphed into what it is today. Um, but again, that only worked within 50 miles of our storefront because the user had to be oh. within a certain radius. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, wow. you know, fast forward year, year and a half down the road, you know, well, I take that back. So pandemic restrictions start lifting and we considered phasing that out and going back to the in-person business model. And uh, we found that there was still a significant number of our users who would rather play from home. So we left that service up and running. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine was in the cloud computing space and said, hey, have you ever thought about taking this into the cloud and allowing users from anywhere to yeah. tap into this? Um, and that had the potential to open us up to a global audience. Uh, there, there's a lot of um, hurdles that we had to overcome and a lot of technical things that we had to figure out in order for that to work. But here we are a year and a half later. Um, you know, it, the craziest part is once AWS found out what we were doing, they they said, you know, this is a really cool use case. What can we do to help? So we've had AWS's help from day one. Um, and then NVIDIA found out about what we were doing and said, hey, this is this is amazing. Uh, this is another great use case for our NVIDIA cloud GPUs. How can we help? So we've had NVIDIA's help. Uh, it's just kind of, it's just been uh, like the industry's almost been pulling us along is what it's felt yeah. like, uh, which is really, really different from the grind of being an entrepreneur that I'm used yeah. to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, we've overcome those technical hurdles, some compression and streaming technologies had to be created in order to make this cloud streaming work, uh, low latency type things. But um, 
you know, right now we're still in early access. It launched uh, November 1st is when we launched it on SideQuest VR. And we've got about 1,200 active users that are giving us great feedback. And uh, so far, you know, platform is running as expected. So we couldn't be happier. Wow, man, this is this is pretty insane. I, I just don't even know where to begin because you just explained the whole entrepreneurial journey in five minutes. You're like the, <laughs> the YouTube shorts of an entrepreneur, a success story. Man, so so uh, I, I, I got to go back and try to understand a little more. So you started the brick and mortar, the, the arcade VR, where basically people come in, you give them the goggles, you have the PCs, the servers running, and then they you know, play with their friends. Uh, the, the, the escape room, the escape the room, things like that with Assassin's Creed and you know, Medusa and all that stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the big that's the big advantage to a storefront like mine is that you yeah. get that that high quality 4K you know graphically intense ray traced experience um, yeah. that you can't get typically on you know this MetaQuest headset right here um, because the, that headset is essentially no more powerful than your cell phone. You know, it's it's uh, all built into the headset. Yeah. There's no computer running that. Um, so, you know, we'll have customers come out to the store here. They'll try one of these escape rooms and say, man, VR is so cool. Yeah. I've got to get one of these. So they'll get on <laughs> Amazon. They'll buy that, yeah. that $300 headset. And then they come in a month later and say, well, that is nothing like what we do here. So, uh, you know, it felt like they wasted their money on that headset. Um, so what this streaming service does is it taps into that cloud computing and allows the user to stream PC VR quality content onto that MetaQuest headset without the $4,000 computer at the house, without all of the setup. Um, just, you know, just simply having that MetaQuest at the, head at the house. So this is, so basically, instead of going to your storefront, I can just sit here and I can be, you know, experiencing the same quality, the 4K and play with my friends or, you know, I, I can do the whole thing right here with a MetaQuest Pro, but connect it to your streaming service. Uh, wow, that's on Amazon AWS. Yeah, yeah, we've instantiated all over the United States AWS infrastructure. So anywhere that has a, you know, there's some areas of the U.S. that are still out of reach for us. If you get down toward Florida, the the ping is too great because there's no nodes down that way yet. Yeah. Um, but for the majority of the, of the United States, uh, you know, you're gonna get you're gonna get access to our service. Um, and Amazon has told us that they're working on nodes to cover the rest of the U.S. by the end yeah. of 2024, I believe. Um, so we should have the entire U.S. as well as uh, Frankfurt, Germany, Paris, France, uh, parts of Asia um, by the end of 2023. So, so, so now my uh, what I'm thinking is, what do I have to do to get get your service? Is it publicly available, or I gotta be in your good terms with you to to get a special treatment, or what what is the situation? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's publicly available. It's in what we're calling early access. You have okay. to jump through a few hoops right now because we're not on the native Oculus Quest store yet. Okay. Uh, so you've got to go to a website called sidequestvr.com. You have to what they call sideload the application onto your headset. It's it's a process that has a few extra steps to it okay. that you typically wouldn't have to do to download an app. But um, if you go to sidequestvr.com, they, they lay out the steps pretty simply you know it's uh it's, it's a pretty simple process you just have to follow a couple youtube videos yeah. but we are hopeful to be in the side quest or the the actual oculus native store soon we've applied with it's a process you have to go through okay so then you're going to be fully available oculus native anybody buying an oculus you come in right there and uh so so what can i play with that streaming service the side quest yes. vr so um so any pc vr content is available to us. And then we curate what we think are the better experiences to put into the platform. Um, you know, again, we have our VR escape rooms that um, we're famous for their, you know, the Ubisoft escape games. We have a few other providers that we work with as well, uh, developers that we work with. So those are going to be there uh, as well as, you know, 100, 150 different VR arcade titles uh, or, you know, PC VR games, uh, everything from uh, Half-Life Alex to Boneworks, a lot of these really graphically intense PC VR titles that the average user doesn't have access to. Uh, that's that's our, our sweet spot is being able to offer those games that the average gamer doesn't have access to because they don't have the $4,000 ray traced gaming computer at the house. Uh, 
Yeah, and now Amazon is providing that. But is but Amazon AWS? You know, so many of my friends complain it's so expensive. Is it super expensive on you, or uh, is it going to be passed on the onto the users? Or yeah, so we had to model our our platform accordingly. Um, ah. You know, we're still in early access, so we're trying to figure out exactly what that price per user, price per minute looks like for us. Yes. Yes. Um, but we're confident that we can offset that cost to the end user with advertiser spend and wow. other things within the space that yeah. uh, will will alleviate that from the user. Our goal, uh, once we can get into full production, is to have a $10 a month subscription fee that covers your usage and we offset that with advertiser spend and uh, things like wow. that. Wow, like $4,000 versus $120 a year. Wow, man, you were like killing everybody. This is this is fantastic. I think I feel like, uh, you know, you were like the early days of the internet when anybody can build a calculator, anybody can do something and that goes viral, right? And becomes the next big thing. I think, I think you were in that phase of the VR. As VR grows, you grow organically. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be pushing, oh, my app has to be better than the competitor. You are organically growing bigger and bigger, right? Right. And the, and the fact that we're VR game developers first and foremost, okay. um, has, we, have an, we have a connection to a lot of these other VR developers in the space. And the biggest hurdle right now for AAA developers, for VR game developers in general, is that you can't deliver the quality of game to the user that you want to as a developer because 90 percent of the customers have that meta quest headset that has a very limited download space very limited processing power so a lot of these very intense you know amazing games can't be made because they, there's there's no way to to sell that to the masses so we've actually partnered with a few different developers who are really excited to use this platform exclusively to deliver those high quality pc vr experiences that they want to create but they've shelved because to date there's just not a, a way for them to to make that worthwhile for them essentially so because uh you know for them they're just developing the game and then trying to sell it to the consumer, whereas you are coming up with other ways of economics, such as advertising, you're bringing maybe some membership deal, and you know the scalability, once you scale at certain point, it's profitable kind of way, I think the Amazon style. So I think you are bringing in a lot of different sides together, not just, oh, we are just doing, doing it on the cloud, then other people, oh, why don't I do it? But you, know, you are offering an ecosystem, I think that's what, uh, that's what you are. What you exactly. Are. Yeah, yeah. And we're also a quality control of sorts because another issue that developers have in PC VR gaming, users have different kinds of computers, different setups, different graphics cards. So you can never really be sure that you're delivering the same level of experience to every user. But with the abstract, you know that every user has this specific graphical instance. They are going to have the same experience across the board. Um, so you can really guarantee that, that your vision is getting across to the end user the way that you intend. Wow, man. Okay, okay. I, I gotta, I gotta refresh my mind. You, you have delivered some amazing ideas, and I'm, I'm an optimist. You know, I, as soon as I get ideas, I'm, I get super excited. I get just blown away. Uh, so mm -hmm. before I get to get there, I, I wanna, I wanna ask you, what's, how did you get to this gaming world? What, what happened? You know, I wanna, I wanna hear that story. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've been a gamer, avid gamer most of my life. Uh, I went to college for health service administration. That's what my degree's in. So not not in this space at all. Yeah. Um, but it's business, essentially. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, avid gamer for most of my life. Uh, and then, you know, kind of like we touched on earlier, I struggled with addiction uh, in my early 20s, uh, you know, had a had an opiate addiction to pills. And, and that really sidetracked my career. And I had to sit back and think about what was important to me and and really um, kind of reevaluate my life. And at that point, I, you know, decided that I wasn't I wasn't going to kill myself in corporate America to try to get ahead in the in the way that I knew how to do because it was just so draining and and just wasn't what I envisioned for myself. So um, we looked at our passions and we said what can we do that we're passionate about and gaming you know so we opened the vr arcade and then you know COVID hit and i've got a i've got to say a, a big shout out to our 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 bank uh ecdi because when the pandemic hit and we couldn't pay our loan payment because we didn't get these 
these stimulus funds and what have you, yeah. um, they sat down with and, and said, it's a shame that you have, you know, $70,000 worth of high end gaming PCs and equipment down there that are just sitting. Uh, what can we do to help you bring in revenue? So brainstorming and, and said, you know what I'd love to do is try to make a video game because I love uh -huh. gaming. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being that I had connections to Ohio University um, and and the bank had connections to Ohio State, which are the two main colleges here in Ohio, um, made those connections. And we got some interns involved from Ohio State, from Kent State, Shawnee State. And we just went to work on a concept that I had for a video game. And, uh, you know, that that really occupied us through most of the pandemic uh, and and took us about 12 months to put that game together, but it's currently available on Steam VR right now. Uh, on the Steam store, it's called The Deed of Deception. Uh, it's our it's our baby. We're really proud of it. But, uh, but yeah, and that just kind of snowballed again our design studio into working on these other projects. Yeah. Um, you know, we created a, um, a VR classroom, not to get too far off topic, but we created a VR classroom during that period as well to allow students to experience the class uh in a vr headset versus sitting at home on their chromebooks yeah. and we got some notoriety and some some attention from a news outlet here in ohio for that so it's just been uh you know kind of one thing snowballed into another and you know here we are two two and a half years later <laughs> and uh it's just it's a wow. it's a wild ride you have so many things going on and uh so uh, before uh, before that a deed of deception what, what is this game about? That's that's super cool. It, are you gonna keep it in the cool area, or you're gonna expand it, or you're gonna take it to the next level? What's the idea? Yeah, yeah. So the Deed of Deception, um, it starts out as a cooperative game. You're you're all called to this mansion because a deceased relative is leaving his inheritance to who can never can find the deed within this house. Uh, uh, it's a puzzle game. You're working together yeah. to find this deed, um, solving puzzles and what have you. And then at some point, uh, a user will find the deed and find out that there is no inheritance to be won. It's actually a haunted house. And whoever grabbed the deed is now possessed by the house and wants to kill everybody <laughs> else in the mansion. <laughs> wow. So it becomes at that point, it becomes a 1v3 experience where the uh, the person who possessed by the house has special abilities and they're trying to trap everybody and steal their souls. But, um, but the game is designed to lay out their mansion randomly each time you play so each time you play you'll have a different experience because the layout's going to be different oh. but then also the game mechanics change each time the haunt starts so we have uh right now three different haunts coded so there's a randomized option of which one you get and uh that that will also change the gameplay so the the goal was that we create a game that we can keep iterating and make it to where the user can have a different experience each time they play and just continue to play this over and over again um we're still in uh, we're still working on it we're not done yet yeah, but getting them hooked getting them addicted to the game <laughs> yeah the yeah, deed of deception yeah. so that's going to be your objective reality gaming studio or what are, are you going to do separate llc or have one umbrella company or what are you planning to do the structuring of yeah so right now we're a corporate we're an object reality incorporated we've okay. taken all of our intellectual property and packaged it under that entity uh we, we've actually done a pre-seed round already successfully uh raised about two hundred thousand dollars wow congrats and, uh, yeah, yeah that's yeah. great and uh, so yeah that's where, that's where all the intellectual property will will okay. be housed and that's where we plan on working through all of these different projects but you know it sounds kind of disjointed because of all these different things but yeah. if you look at it as the the abstract that we started out talking about is the platform that these yeah. things jump off from uh, it, it kind of makes more sense that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The abstract, that's also one of your, uh, that's the streaming invention, right? The the whole streaming yeah, ecosystem. Yeah. Right. That, that's, and that's, you know, we have some patent pending intellectual property there that's pretty unique, that yeah. is it, the backbone of this platform. But again, it, it just allows us to deliver this PC VR content to the at home user without the need for the head, the, the gaming PC and, yeah. uh, and all of that. And there's, there's commercial application for that as well, which we're, we're currently, uh, writing grants for and talking to the military about, uh, you know, there, there's potential there for this to be a really great training environment for, you know, say, say military or corporate trainings, because, you know, you can just deliver the MetaQuest headset to the user and have them put the headset on and they're ready to go. No server setup, no, you know, any of that. And, yeah. um, and that's kind of the, the commercial side of it that we're working on.
Wow, that's the, so you got at least 10 different projects in your head going on. You, you're like a machine. You are a VR. Uh... <laughs> that, that's what I was saying. It seems a little disjointed, but if you look at it like the the abstract is kind of the umbrella platform that, that hosts all this stuff, I guess it, it doesn't seem as chaotic that way. Oh, I, I like it. I like it. You know, a lot of people, a lot of the VCs in the Valley, they, they tell entrepreneurs, you got to focus on one thing. And, uh, you know, uh, not, not a lot of people know this. Jeff Bezos in the early days of Amazon, he wanted to do everything. You give him one idea, oh yeah, we're gonna do that. Another idea, he's gonna do that. He wanted to do everything. I, I see you have like similar passion because you don't wanna, because if you don't try it, how would you know whether that would have worked or not, right? So that's a, you know, it's better to try faster and fail a lot of these, but at least have a few. Then at the end of uh, the day, you know, the company bet like the Mark Zuckerberg did, that didn't, <laughs> that was kind of like, <laughs> oh, you should have invested in a lot of things so that, you know, we didn't have to go there. But, but I, I like the ideas, you know, what you're working on now. Now, so how, how is it, is it all you or a couple of engineers or you have kind of like a structure, you got the CFO, the COO, things like that. Yeah, we don't have a CTO yet. We're we're hopeful that that'll be one of our first things we do in 2023. Um, nice. But we do have a team of six. We have wow. you know multiple programming engineers. We have a uh, artist, uh, graphic graphic artist, 3D modeler. Um, so level design is another field that we needed. You know that kind of manages the project from a from a flow perspective, how things kind yeah. of flow. But uh, but yeah, six of us today. Um, we outsource a little bit of work here and there when we need to, um, because we don't have anybody on team that, that focuses on specific other tasks that we, we need, but, um, you know, web design and stuff like that. But, yeah, yeah. but yeah, we have a core team of six that have been with me for the last two and a half, almost three years. And he must be a good boss. They're, they're sticking with you. That's, that's super awesome. So, so are, are they all in Ohio or they're all remote? No, they're all remote. Yeah. So wow. uh, we have one one employee that works out of our office here. Um, okay. The rest are, you know, live in Texas, northern Ohio, out in California. <clears throat> uh, when we outsource, we outsource things to other countries sometimes. So but wow. uh, but yeah, all over the U.S. Yeah. Man, so you are a beneficiary of the remote culture. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I wasn't I wasn't sure if I was going to be a fan of it initially, yeah, but yeah. Um, honestly, you know, as long as you use a good project management tool, uh, I don't want to, you know, shout out the one that we're using, I guess, but oh, which uh, one is it? Really it? Does. So we use we use uh, uh, Jira. Oh, Jira, yes, very popular, very very popular, yeah, yeah. very good. You, uh, you have chosen right stuff. You're you're on the right track, man. I, I like it. I like it. So, but yeah, this, it's uh, it's. It, no, it works out well. I, I do enjoy the uh, remote working. Yeah. So this is uh, so now uh, the brick and mortar business, I think, which is currently the profitable side of the operations, right? Keep keeps the revenue going, keeps keeps things flowing. So it, are you planning to expand that, or you just want to keep it running as it is and put all the money into your streaming operation? Yeah, we had intentions, you know, right out of the gate, we wanted, we had a plan that we would by, you know, 2021, we would have our next store open 2023. And, and uh, that monkey wrench kind of got thrown into that with the pandemic, not to keep harping on it. But, no. um, but I've kind of reevaluated, I think we're, we're probably gonna open a second location. Okay. But um, it's always been my understanding that sometime in the near future the vr arcade will go the way of the arcade of the 80s you know as as and yeah. and i guess uh the the funny part of that is that i'm developing the platform that will eventually be the downfall <laughs> of the industry uh potentially <laughs> so, yes uh... um, but you know so i i know there's there's a shelf life to yeah. this brick and mortar business uh so i you know i want to be very conscious of that and not not dump more money into it than uh, we can get back out of it, I guess. <laughs> because uh, as far as I understand, that business, you have a big uh, one-time expense to set up, the setup expense, the initial. And after that, it kind of, the labor cost, the payroll, you know, that keep things running, right? So, you know, that also has, um, I, 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 did, you, did you try to do like a franchise model on that or? Yeah, we have uh, we have it on our website right now. We've got uh, two locations that license our our software and our platform to do that. We don't have a, another objective reality location yet, franchise, oh, yeah. but uh, but we are always open to that. I think it 
you know, like you said, the upfront expense is a little high, yeah. but uh, as far as, you know, a return on investment, you can't really get much better. You know, you don't, right. uh, you know, the upfront investment keeps you up to date for about five years. You don't have to worry about replacing hardware. Most of this stuff is very durable. Um, and the return is, is really great, you know? So I think it is a, a very, a, a very enticing business model. Um, yeah. and, you know, I think that, uh, like I said, I haven't really dove into that piece of it as much as I would like yeah. to, just because other things have kind of taken precedence. Yeah, that's true. Because, you know, the reason I, 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 I got back to that is yesterday I was doing a video on uh, uh, these YouTubers building the ecosystem, the YouTube economy, the creator economy, and they're going into physical space. They have this trick shot tower. They're spending a hundred million dollars to build these theme parks and things like that. And I was mm. saying this thing that, you know, the malls, we say the retail is dead. It is dead. But if we bring in the interactive space, stuff like the VR, play with your friends, right. you know, spend, you know, do VR bowling or whatever, those kind of thing. I think that could be, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's a fun activity, uh, right? More interactive things instead of just shopping, right? Yeah, yeah. And I've actually seen that from, uh, we've had a few different malls reach out to us asking if we would be interested in moving into some mall locations. So I'm, I'm seeing that on the mall owner's side as well. They're really looking yeah. at making it a, a inter interactive kind of destination location type thing instead of just shopping. All so right. that's definitely something that I think is coming. I think, uh, but even if you can uh, pass on some of the upfront cost to the mall owners, you know, kind of offset some of those expenses, the leasing terms. I think I think, I think, think you got that, that side of the business may not be as futuristic, you know, or as cool in the valley kind of thing. But I think that's that's a good business. And that's a, that's something since you have the expertise. And now you're not just staying there, you're going to the next level, building a platform that can replace the old VR arcade stuff. And, you know, bring in the, the whole at, at home streaming, right at home playing with your friends. Now, I, I got to ask you, I don't want to, you know, go too much. Do, are you facing any challenge from any large corporation that's going to try to take you out or, you know, make an acquisition offer or something like that? Is that is that something you feel some pressure or? We were concerned initially that that would be something we'd face pretty mm -hmm. early on. Um, but surprisingly, no. Um, you know, we've, we've had the warmest welcome from NVIDIA and AWS, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, like I said, pretty surprising. Um, but we haven't heard back from Meta yet on our acceptance into their platform. So, you know, being that they are the, the, the metaverse people, yeah, yeah. you know, there may be, there, there may be something there. I don't know, but, um, uh, to date, yeah, it's been really receptive. It's, um, it's really encouraging. I think if you got Nvidia and Amazon on your side, man, you are, uh, you are in the big league. So I, I, I think they're, <laughs> they're gonna, that, that, that's fantastic. I, I, I don't think Meta would, uh, I, I think Meta would be supportive as far as I can think of, because it's expanding their services, right? Uh, it's like they built something and you're offering all your energy, it's like the apps, right? App on an iPhone, all the millions of dollars you spend to build the app. Apple is part beneficiary of that, right? So, exactly. you know, it, it, it's yeah. kind of something what you're doing. I, I, I like that. And also, you know, I, I'm not the VR person. I, 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 I haven't uh, gone into the, I left the tech world quite a while ago. I have engineers that are working on all these projects, but I, I'm not the gamer that goes in and plays these games. So when, when I learn from you, I'm like, wow, man, I want to try it out too, right? How, how does it feel like uh, these arcade games? I know the actual arcade games, but I don't know how in the VR, how it feels, right? So yeah, this, this is a totally different experience. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, we do a lot of corporate events where it's not your typical gamers. Uh, they'll they'll come down, or we do remote remote uh, things as well. But wow. uh, the escape rooms, you become the controller, so it's not like you have to be a gamer necessarily. Yeah. And you're just trying to do these escape rooms. You know, in one of them, you're in Medusa's lair. You're trying to figure out how to get out of Medusa's lair, and you're working together. You're passing things back and forth. You know, and it, it just feels once you get. Once you understand the mechanics of how, okay, this button picks things up and, and this yeah. does this, you know, you really get immersed into it in a way that you can't get immersed in a, just looking at a TV screen. So it really is something special. One thing I got to ask you, this, uh, you know, when I s watched the Metaverse uh, uh, intro by Zuckerberg and, you know, the Metaverse things, I see these avatar looking things that are not very realistic. That's like, you know, back when I was a kid, those things existed, right? <laughs> like what happened after all these technology so but you are bringing in the 4k experience right it, it's more uh, 
you know, more precise location, the more realistic looking. Is that true or are you doing very avatarish thing or? <laughs> Yeah, so you're you're right. You know, when you look at the work that that Meta has done and a lot of this stuff, they've they've been really focused on how can we leverage the equipment that the user has. So how can we give the user the experience on that Quest Two headset? Yeah. Um, and and what we've done is tapped into that decentralized cloud computing, where we're letting the cloud computer run and process all of this high quality PC VR. Uh, stuff where we can, you know, potentially give someone a realistic full body avatar that looks like them that, you know, um, has all that stuff. So there, and, and one of the developers we're working with, um, is focused on that specifically. They want to be able to give someone in this yeah. metaverse experience a realistic avatar. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely a direction that this is going. Oh man, you sold me. The, I'm sold completely, <laughs> completely sold now. Because if you can make it realistic, I will buy it, whatever the price tag it is. And I'm sure a lot of older people would be like, yes, I got, you know, whatever it is. I, I don't want to look cartoon and, you know, I, I don't know about the all that stuff, but if it's realistic, that's it. You know, I, I think that's the, that's one of the areas you can definitely uh, the, even do like membership layers, right? How realistic do you want it? You know, you want a hundred dollar a month or, you know, something like that. That that could be a possibility. Uh, right. But yeah, that that's that's amazing. So this is, I, I, man. After hearing these, I'm like very excited about this streaming. Uh, I think you call it the PC VR uh, on the cloud, right? Right. Essentially, yeah. It's, oh, it's okay. It's computer, you know, PC quality computer rendered graphics on your MetaQuest headset without having the computer at home. Oh yeah. wow! Yes, I, I think you need to patent that. That's that's your trademark. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, when we first, so we're with uh, a company called Rev One Ventures here in Ohio. They've been really supportive since our early, early stage uh, development. And that's that's been the one thing that they've tried to help us more than anything is how do you package this and, and explain it in a way that people uh, understand, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, it's a struggle. <laughs> it really is a struggle sometimes, but um, it's definitely something we've been working on is how do we really get across what this platform is? you know, elevator pitch style, you know, to where people understand it. Uh, so I'm glad that I was able to. <laughs> no, you did it very well. And now, now I'm like, this is all in my head. I'm like, wow, yes. Why Why isn't a lot of people working on it? This is a brilliant idea. And uh, so, so now you are in the pre-seed stage. Are you planning to aggressively go raise funds? Are you going to go seed angel, like go, go, go style and, you know, take it to the next level? Or you want to take it slow? You want to you know, what, what's the direction you're kind of going with? We want to be aggressive. You know, yeah. uh, we're like, we're with Rev1 Ventures. They've got, um, we've worked together on a plan to get us into our next round of funding okay. uh, early 2023. And, um, you know, like you said, we're, we're, we're in the big leagues with all these, you know, yeah. huge companies. So we've got to kind of step up and be able to deliver this finished product uh, to the market as soon as possible. Um, so to that end, you know, our, our roadmap has us starting our seed round um, in February, hopefully closing by June. Okay. The economy isn't the, the best right now. So, you know, yeah. I, I, I try to be realistic. Uh, but, you know, again, um, we've got a great team. We've got yeah. uh, we've got patent pending some really interesting technologies that um, give us an advantage in the space so you know we feel pretty good about it no i i think no that that's definitely definitely a very achievable goal based on what you have uh, you know already achieved in this space already you, you have demonstrated any everything that an investor would like to see now the one one thing i think the investor would also like to know is have you figured the product market fit like is there any do you have a user base and uh, and how many what the feedbacks are anything you want to share yeah yeah we did extensive product market fit research analysis and uh we've really honed in on those those for the consumer market the yeah. the at-home gamer who wants to play better quality content but doesn't have the money to buy the four thousand dollar computer mm -hmm. um, as well as the competitive vr gaming audience um, because we can offer through this platform we can do hosted tournaments and competitions and yeah. you know have challenges and things like that which are all going to be drawing points for those audiences um, 
And you know, in that market, we've we've identified about uh, 1.5 million active users uh, that were were hopeful to yeah. be able to get pretty uh, early early adapters. And uh, we we currently have a wait list of 25,000 people that are waiting for us to fully le- release the platform. Some people, as I mentioned, aren't really uh, savvy enough or interested in going to sidequestvr.com and going through the process of sideloading it. So uh, we anticipate th- the majority of that audience will jump onto the platform once we get onto the native store uh, yeah. within the headset. Um, but that, you know, again, that's just the consumer side of it. Uh, we're working very hard on the commercial aspect as well. Here in Ohio, Intel just uh, broke ground on a semiconductor facility that they're um, you know, several billion dollars in production, and uh, and they've tasked Ohio State University, which we're connected to through our venture capital firm Rev One Ventures, um, to help with creating training policies and procedures for this facility prior to opening. Um, and our goal is to demonstrate that with the abstract, we can deliver realistic VR training simulations for the you know so the uh, potential employee can get in the headset can practice doing their job in vr before the factory opens so that when the factory opens they're hitting the ground running um so those kinds of things are what we're really focused on on the commercial side Uh, wow so uh so another thing is so you have that's a very profitable area like the events the vr events competitive gaming and the corporate right you're helping the corporations to train their employees so i i think you might have mentioned or i have seen uh, seen on your website uh for those kind of training i think you are bringing in ar and vr together the augmented and the virtual together you're probably using some hololens or in the meta quest i don't know uh, whether it has the ar capability but uh so are you also working in the ar side or yeah, it just kind of depends on the use case. So oh. if it was something where, say, the end user had to manipulate uh, a piece of machinery yeah. in order to do the work, it could be an AR type situation where they're wearing the the, the Hololens and interacting with real world objects. Um, versus if it were just simply a, a VR complete VR simulation, um, you know, it, it just kind of case specific type of type of stuff. Any of the Meta stuff, uh, the Meta Quest Pro and all that, uh, is the Quest Pro is that? also AR capable or not like the necessarily there is pass through cameras that allow you to see your environment yeah. and you can you can do that to an extent but uh, you're not going to get the same level of experience as you would with a hololens um the cameras kind of leave your field of view a little grainy it's not the best quality picture so um you know for if somebody was looking for an ar specific experience i would definitely recommend the hololens over the wow. now i haven't used the quest pro yet so that might be a different situation i'm just oh, yeah quest 2 is what i'm meta quest 2 yeah because yeah because otherwise the corporations will have to be like okay we got to buy meta quest pro uh meta quest 2 and then we got to get a microsoft hololens we gotta you know and then multiple hardware like okay just go to your computer watch youtube <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, so I think I think the device now. Now, are you looking into the device space at any point, or you're just okay? Let the big corporations do their thing. I will just focus on the software. Yeah, we've we've kind of we have uh, entertained the idea uh, early on. There was a, a company that reached out to us that asked if we were interested. Um, so we did entertain it, but I think we, like you said, we kind of came to the realization that that has so much upfront cost and so many yeah. moving parts that uh, we'll just let the big guys <laughs> do that. Um, yeah. That being said, we've we've had some interesting conversations with Pico uh, that uh, is like the MetaQuest equivalent for the Asian market um, where there there could be some synergies there. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's uh, this is this is very interesting because if you can get a few loyal users, uh, you know, that's very loyal to the platform you're providing them. Man, you control the device guys. They're gonna come to you like, hey, you know, how can we help, right? So this is this is very interesting. So th- this this whole thing, I think you are not afraid of trying out new things. You're always trying, right? Whether it's even applying for grants, you know, talking to the universities, talking to, you know, you are just out there, not just uh, thinking about it. You're just doing it before even worrying about what happens, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's a big part of, I think, being a successful entrepreneur is taking your plan and putting it into action. You know, it's, it's, 
it's one thing to have an idea and think that you know you can think it out every which way to see if it's going to work and then execute six months from now or you know uh have the the initiative to go out and do it and yeah. learn you know as you go i think is there, there's benefits to both sides of it um but in this space you know like you said it's it's very early in the cloud computing uh, industry and and we really felt that getting out first and figuring out as we go was more important than yeah. you know, than sitting for a year and a half developing and coming to the market fully ready uh, I suppose but you know I think I think your approach is the correct one like you know trying it out going out there and see which one sticks and how it works you know uh, the, you know instead of developing I think that somebody was saying the other day uh, the German developers they perfect the craft but by the time they come to the market the software has already moved on whereas the Silicon Valley is like you know whatever you have go ahead go ahead see how the user react and let the user be the guinea pig of <laughs> fixing the things and then you fix those as fast as you can I, I think I think you are the, the this is talking to you the only thing I can think of is the early days of the internet and you are like the early days of VR and personalized VR at home you know but in Enjoy VR at your own, uh, you know, environment. Enjoy it at your own living room, right? Kind of, exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. Wow! And and then if you can bring the realistic looking pictures, that's I I don't know what else I can be asking you. <laughs> that you know, what else can I ask for? No, oh, no. So that's that's a that's another question. Since you are so immersed into this uh, into this ecosystem, into the VR and AR world, what do you see? the industry evolving to i think you kind of mentioned the arcade vr might be you know not going to be the thing of the future but you know the platform you're developing but what do you see five to ten years down the road how the industry would shape yeah i mean i think there's always going to be a place for your standard xbox pc type of gaming um because not everybody is a fan of putting the headset on but um you know i really see and my hope is that that offering developers this platform where they can have license to to build whatever they feel would be you know an amazing experience without limitations on processing power and and you know latency and, and things like that i think will open up the vr gaming industry to really amazing content uh really you know I immersive experiences and uh and and i really do see that the the uh incorporation of cloud computing into the VR experience is going to deliver that high quality experience. Mm -hmm. And and my hope is that that pushes the industry forward as far as developing um, content. But I think also um, the, the industry, you know, corporate America and the military are seeing the potential for VR. And if you go on to the SBIR website or look at, um, you know, look at any open topics, they, they are typically asking for those types of solutions. How can we better utilize VR? How can we use AR? Um, so, so I think that you're going to see within the next five or 10 years, a push to make a lot of virtual training environments, both in corporate yeah. and military. Because you also have the military experience, man. You, you got everything covered, and and you can bring that in because uh, you know in in the valley we talk about this that the the modern warfare is not going to be with people. It's going to be a bunch of drones, but people sitting in their basement or you know in the uh, at, at home running these robots that are fighting on the on the field. So it's not human beings going in with a gun. It's it's the whole robots that are doing the fighting, right? So and and the how would that happen without the improvement in VR, right? AR and VR, of course, AR is, so AR and VR is, is fundamental for that, right? And you could be a part of that because since you're providing more realistic look instead of avatarish thing, so in the battlefield, we want to get as perfect picture as we can before we launch something, right? So I think that that's another area. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, similar to the commercial or the, the consumer side, we would like to be the platform where other developers, ourselves included, make content, but open it up to anyone who, you know, understands how to use uh, Unreal and what have you can build content for our platform. And then we just become the distribution portal for these high quality experiences. Um hopefully in the military side as well. But, yeah. uh, you know, that's that's our goal is to just be the, the launch pad for all these different developers to create really cool stuff. 
Man, that is, I think, gonna be the ultimate success for at, at least uh, you know the and and that that was the whole thing, right? Uh, even uh, uh, Steve Jobs, when he was talking to Salesforce CEO, you know, Salesforce created the App Exchange, and Steve Jobs said, "You have to have other developers develop app on your platform." If that doesn't happen, you don't have a business. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to build a platform where other developers can use the API or use the platform, can use the, the whole setup, the infrastructure, and, and develop apps, their games, their things, and distribute. And so you're like a gatekeeper. Man, this is, this is so amazing. It's just crazy. And you're doing it sitting in the middle of Ohio with a bunch of other businesses and a lot of other overheads. Uh, wow, you know, this is, this is uh, eye opening. This is, that's for sure. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's just crazy. Now, you have something that, where people can run and you, you have the whole experience of jumping and stuff going on uh, and, and with, with, with the goggles. Is that something you also are, are you're part of? Yeah, yeah. So we didn't create that technology by any means, uh, but we do love. It's called omnidirectional treadmill technology, um, and we love it. We think it. Uh, you know, it's it's a really immersive way to to get into VR. Um, we use it here in store. I have a few different setups where people can get in there, strap in, and put the the shoes on, and then you just run around on this concave pad that has motion sensors and things built into it that spins 360 degrees, and you can run in any direction. And it translates your movement into VR. Um, you know, again, another requirement for that is that you have the gaming PC that can run yeah. the, the you know the headset and the um, and the treadmill. So you know, there, there's a potential there that we could offer that computing to say yeah. a Chromebook, and then you can plug them together. So um, yeah, I think that that is a really cool technology. I think that it's probably going to stay in the VR arcade space primarily just because the overhead, you know, the cost on those things is four to yeah. $5,000. So uh, it's not something that your average gamer is going to get. But if you yeah. have the opportunity to check it out, I definitely recommend trying it out because it's pretty cool. Wow. So you have that experience you're providing uh, to your uh, the store customers, right? The omnidirectional, uh, omnichannel treadmill, right? Wow. Yeah, and that's what kind of makes us a good fit for this business model. You know, we, we were able to make this platform and sure there's some technical aspects to it that make it really unique. But more than that, we're able to curate content because we own a VR arcade. We know what content mm -hmm. is impressive. We know what people want to play. Um, and, you know, being developers, we have connections to these developers and we can help, you know, navigate through different uh, experiences. So, you know, there's just a, a kind of a intersection there between technology and utility that uh, is really, yeah. really exciting. Yeah, that's that's where I'm. I'm just so impressed because a lot of people, you know, especially the technologists, they think of the cool technology and how that would change the world, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't think how the customer is receiving it, how they're experiencing it. And you are blending both, right? Because you are seeing firsthand how a person responds or reacts to it first time, and then you're going talking to the developers. Now, with the next round that you're you're trying to raise. Uh, What's the plan? Go hire a CTO and you know expand the team, the software guys, or focus more on the graphic side. What's the main focus going to be? Yeah, CTO for sure. That's that's prior, prior number one. You know, we have a really talented team, but we're missing that experience. Most of our team is recent college grads, so we're just missing that that executive level technology uh, person. So that's prior number one. Uh, you know, after that, we're really going to dive into marketing. So I'd love to hire a great marketing person that can get our web presence built out correctly and really focus on those targeted marketing campaigns and things like that. Um, you know, we're we're almost ready to go to market full launch. So, you know, just shoring up some of those loose ends on pieces that we don't have in-house that we have to outsource. Um, so those are our key areas that we're really focused on. But for marketing, I want you, you know, I want you to be the face because I like the way you are built. This is, this is fantastic. And I'm sure other, uh, you know, investors, when they look at it, they were like, wow. And even consumers, because I saw one of your, uh, by the way, uh, your wife is also involved uh, in this journey. You guys are doing it together. Yeah, yeah. We started the arcade together. You know, we, we took out this loan and we went to Lowe's and bought 
saw and hammers and built everything ourselves from the computers wow. to networking the cables to the computers to everything. So if you come to our storefront, everything in here, we built ourselves. <laughs> so, man, wow. Congrats. My, uh, she's my rock for sure. No, that's awesome, man. This is so the other thing is, are you planning to have the headquarter, the, the, the everything set up in Ohio or at some point you're like, hey, you know what, maybe we're going to move to uh, California or Austin, Texas or Florida or any of these places uh, w w or, or New York. <laughs> what's the what's the plan on that? Yeah, um, we've been told a few different times that if we really want to get out into the industry in a, in a real way, it's going to involve moving to California. That's that's <laughs> been what we've been told. Um, I, you know, I have kids here in, in Ohio, they're in school. So the thought of uprooting everyone to California doesn't sound the, the most appealing thing, but, um, you know, if it does turn out that that's where we need to be, then that's where we'll go. But, uh, yeah, but, you know, I, Ohio, Ohio, I don't know how much you know about the tech scene in Ohio, but, uh, it's really been growing quite a bit here in the last couple of years. So there may be a place for us here in Ohio. I think, you know, you were right. I was going to say that I was going to say that California is overhyped too much hype and, and too expensive too much taxes the developers can work for you today the next day they call me tom i'm working for TikTok. i'm like okay i cannot compete with that okay go ahead go ahead that's great for you you know so uh, that's that's one thing i i would say you know in and uh, uh last uh, when i op opened my youtube channel i was watching mr beast and you know how he was able to build the whole stuff in north carolina and it's less clutter, you know, in LA, everybody's so distracted. Whereas over here, he can keep the employees, they're not running away. And if you need a California employee, sure, you can have a satellite office, couple of employees, or you can have them remotely. Either ways, people over here want to work remotely, right? So I, I, I do think Ohio could be the base of, of this operation. Uh, and you probably don't need to move around too much, especially in this hybrid world, right? The, right. the, the remote world. So yeah, this is this is fantastic man I, I i loved it and i'm gonna try it out i'm definitely trying it out and uh, any last thing you want to share with your consumers with investors anybody you know yeah so you know i just want to thank our early investors and our early customers you guys have been the lifeblood to everything we've been able to accomplish we have the most supportive customers in the world um and you know as far as our Next round of funding, uh, you know, if, if you're watching this and you're interested in investing, uh, again, starting in February, we're going to start soliciting for that. Um, you can get more information over at ObjectiveRealityVR.com. We'll have that all updated there. Or, you know, just email me, um, Colin at ObjectiveRealityVR.com. And... Uh, yeah, yeah, we're just excited to see what 2023 is going to have for us. Oh, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be very, very good. I think the future, you, you are tapping into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I think the next time we're going to be joining you either in person or through VR or some kind of thing that you uh, tell me to download, I'm going to go ahead and, and do that. But thank you so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, uh, thank you. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe.